end, unfortunately. Okay, so I am starting to record. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and hit mute all, and then Gary and, and Dan, you just un unmute yourselves as you go, okay? Okay. okay. All right, you guys are ready to go. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, good evening and welcome to our program about places no longer in the West End of Decatur. I'm joined this evening by Dan Hardy, Chris Barnett, Steve Huss, and perhaps even John Cobb. Uh, Melissa will do you our PowerPoint tonight and be sharing pictures and articles from the newspaper. We're gonna talk about places in the West End from the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. These are places that we remember that we walked to, rode our bikes to, maybe drove to, uh, places maybe that we even hung out at. Uh, 50 years ago, it wasn't uncommon to have grocery stores in a neighborhood, maybe even a restaurant or a shop of some kind, maybe even a bar. And all of these places are gone, but they're very much alive in our memories. And so tonight we'll be talking about them and, uh, and, and maybe, uh, at the end, some of you will have an opportunity to share some of your uh, recollections. So let's start with Dan Hardy, who's going to talk about the Oakwood area. Dan, go ahead. Got to unmute. There it is. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Right, I'll get started. I'm going to talk about the Oakwood area. The First slide you see here is a aerial view I took back in 1983 uh, from an airplane. That's why it's called an aerial view. <laughs> it's got Eisner's Grocery still there, and the Blue Mill was still there, and it looks like um, maybe the gas station might have still been there uh, in some form or another. Um, but now the only thing that's uh, none of the Blue Mill is gone, uh, and it's the Town Square building. And it used to be the Tuscany restaurant and the rest of it's all Woods apartment. Okay, next, uh, yeah, this is a 1942 view of the Oakland and Wood uh, area looking to the Northwest. Uh, notice there was a gas station on both corners at the time, uh, Sinclair on the Southwest corner and a Texaco station in the Northwest corner where the Oakwood Plaza is today. Okay. Uh, Around 1952, development of the Oakwood began. Uh, Texaco Station and three houses to the west were raised to make way for a new parking area uh, someday and a single story small shopping area. Plans were to make it a two story building but were changed to a single story before construction began. Uh, next slide is, this is the same area after the demo, demoing of the Texaco station, three houses on wood, asphalt will soon be put down in a parking lot <clears throat> made for the businesses to go in in the area. And uh, you can see the Texaco station still there. But this is a list of the merchants in the area that band together to use 84 by 218 foot parking lot. Some were the Sinclair Station, the Blue Mill, Eisner's, Winery, Varsity Theater, and Cleaners, Pom Pom Cafe, Bucks Barber, and others. Uh, some I'll be talking about. <coughs> okay, this is um, 1955. The Oakwood shopping area was completed, and the original store was Norman's, Norm's, Norman's Cleaners. Uh, it was shown in the lower left-hand part of this map. Uh, as a proposed building at the time. Okay, then finally by 1955, the new shopping center at the corner of the Oakland and Wood is completed. Uh, many of the shops over the years have come and gone from this uh, small plaza. Uh, I think the Norman Cleaners is now pretty much the uh, Jimmy John's. Okay, uh, across the street from there was uh, the Varsity Theater. Is at 1117 Westwood. Uh, planning began, uh, began in 1940 
In November of 40, uh, a house in the 1100 block of Westwood was torn down to make room for the new theater. It was built and opened in 1941. In 1957, the uh, second story seating area was removed and a second floor installed so the building could be converted into a store. Uh, it closed in May of 1955 and it never reopened in 1956. It was uh, Eisner started using it uh, as a grocery uh, store uh, that was next door to the theater at the time. Uh, in 1963, the uh, former varsity theater building was leased to Eisner, or Eisner's uh, grocery company. The entire uh, area would become part of the store and part of the varsity was used uh, as a show, shoe store uh, shown here. I remember I got shoes from there. And it's also a university a barber shop or a beauty shop, I guess. Uh, <coughs> hey, uh, <coughs> okay, this is the AMP store that was next door to it. You can see the varsity theater wall back behind it. Uh, it was, uh, this is at 1135 Westwood. It was built in conjunction with a new business development around the Varsity Theater at the time. It was built on the same right of way as the theater also. Uh, it opened up the stores in June of 1941 with uh, an adjoining parking area to the west toward the railroad tracks. It later became the Eisenhower Grocery Store. Uh, Eisenhower's later built, uh, Eisenhower, Eisner's later built a new building in the back of the old one and the original building was torn down. Um, my favorite memory uh, of the store was I bought a periscope there one time when I turned in some labels from a peanut butter jar. Uh, must have been in the fall because I remember I used the periscope to spy on people going by our house from a pile of leaves my father and I raked up uh, at the time. All right, uh, the Sinclair Station. Now, this is at Oakland and Wood in the southwest corner. Uh, also, it's 1103 Westwood. Uh, it was called Gary and Red Sinclair. The owner was Gary Sullivan and James Red Hagen. It was then a marathon station where Red and his son Steve worked. Uh, in 1974, it was an Arco station and it closed in 1985. Uh, I remember my parents going there to um, get gas uh, when I was little. I also remember my parents going there in the late 60s to get a free set of glasses. I remember the service stations used to give out glasses and stuff for free, uh, Phillips. Uh, there had been a service station in that corner since 1920s. It ended up being torn down in 1996. Uh, Red was a fine mechanic and worked there uh, and at several other stations in town before the one on Oakland and Wood. I believe Red's son, Steve, might be online with us here tonight, Steve Hagen. Uh, okay, uh, this is a blue mill. In 1928, it was in the southeast corner of Oakland. Uh, it was built in 1922 by R.R. R. Elliott, and it was called the Zeller Confectionery until 1924. I think Zeller even owned a building uh, where Ralph's Pub was. He had a confectionery there for a while. Uh, the Blue Mill Drugstore was there until 1927. Uh, this is an interior view of the store, uh, of the uh, Blue Mill. Uh, it was a tea room, took over. And in 1934, the tea room name was dropped from the title and the uh, air conditioning was installed. On April 7, 1956, the interior was severely damaged by fire and restored at a cost of $50,000. That guy in the picture on the right-hand side holding the, the light was my father. I was down there with him during this fire, and he was holding that light for the photographer to uh, take that picture. I think it was, uh, might have been Bob Strongman at the time. All right. And uh, this is the Blue Mill Tea Room, uh, outside look of it. And uh, this is some information about the Blue Mill. 
uh, R.R. Elliott and uh, Bill Litton they had uh, celebrities there from Bill Madlock and Harry Reasoner and uh, Margaret Truman and uh, a comedian named Herb Schreiner. Then it's a price from Bob Crane and Pat O'Brien were there one time or another. This is a demo of the Blue Mill. I think one of the letters from the Blue Mill on the side of the building is used over at the winery right now. Uh, that's what's there today. That's uh, West Town Square, it's called. And uh, this is Rouse Pub. Uh, it was located at 135 South Oakland. Uh, prior to Ralph's, it was just called the pub. Uh, Ralph and Bertha Flisky bought it in January 1946. Uh, I think in 1950, burglars broke in and took a safe containing $275. Uh, I remember the opening day of the lock, stock, and barrel. The lines were so long, we had to wait to get in. So we went into Ralph's pub and bought a six pack of beer for 99 cents and took it over and waited in line at LSB until we could get in the doors. Uh, now this is a uh, lock stock today is lock stock and barrel. It was known as Ben Franklin's Milton's pool hall, LSB. Uh, and uh, at one time it was uh, as built as a movie theater um, called the Oakland theater uh, for $6,000. And that was back in 1913. It didn't last long before the Oakland Avenue garage and gas station uh, uh, took over. Uh, it later uh, see, became what I remember as from when I was a little kid uh, was Ben Franklin's. Uh, Bill Munch and his wife, uh, Donna, bought the store in, at 127 South Oakland from John Amon in April of 1950. Uh, Donna Munch even did income tax preparations and she advertised in, uh, in the paper. There's her ad right there. Uh, she did that for quite a number of years. Uh, of course, uh, these are some of the clippings from the paper. They sold fireworks, Halloween costumes. They, they had it all. I remember going in there many times to yeah, get myself a squirt gun for a nickel. Uh, you could uh, go through a lot of money there. Uh, this is Milton's uh, Billiards in, in 1976. Uh, it wasn't there long, and uh, Gresham's bought it and uh, turned it. Well, they didn't turn it into LSB. Somebody else did, but Gresham's took over after that. Uh, this is an ad from LSB advertising their seven-foot diagonal screen to watch football. And next door there was uh, my writers. It was photo number, or uh, in this photo, that's an old pharmacy. The original building located here at 1101 West Main was built in 1901. It housed the W.O. McCrum drugstore until the, it was torn down in 1932. It was replaced with a single story brick building to house uh, the Raffington uh, drugstore. Uh, this block houses LSB and other businesses. Uh, the most I remember about Night Riders Drugstore was a soda fountain in the counter. You could sit out and have your sodas, shakes, and of course, uh, your cherry Cokes. Uh, it was owned by Gilbert Night Rider uh, from 1949 until his death in 1963. Uh, the soda fountain had Green Rivers, Nickel, Vanilla Coke, and uh, quite a few other items you can you can make your own stuff. Uh, whenever I watch the movie, it's a wonderful life. Around Christmas time, uh, I think of this store and the soda fountain where young George Bailey worked. Uh, this is a uh, Red Craft. Next is Red Craft Drug Store, which is across the street from it. Uh, it dates back to this, this location in 1935 and was remodeled in 1959, and that's when it became McCoy Drugs. Ray Kraft retired and moved to California. Uh, I heard that Gresham's owned that at one time, uh, that owned the LSB. Uh, Gary might know a little bit more about that. 
Uh, it's been several stores since that time. The last was Garcia's Pizza. It has since moved, and another restaurant is about to open there, I hear. Uh, that's the, the winery. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is uh, next part between the winery and uh, Raycrafts was Buck's Barbershop, owned by James Buck Price. Uh, he never took appointments, saying it was too much trouble answering the phone, and he never had a phone in his barbershop. Uh, uh, this is Buck's ad that was in the Milladeck uh, yearbook. You can uh, you can trim them, <laughs> and uh, this is uh, uh, Buck cutting somebody's hair. Uh, he's seventy one year old. Uh, was in the same building at the corner of West Main and South Oakland for the past forty five years. Uh, in nineteen seventy eight, Buck returned to his barber shop just three months after he set aside his uh, clippers after barbering for 50 years. It looked different to the 76 year old barber. A row of booths replaced his chairs and, and his basins. A jukebox replaced his old glass display case. There was now a bar room, part of the winery. Uh, Bob Beeman, uh, the owner of the winery had expanded into the former shop it's, uh, and they called it Buck's Ballroom. At the ribbon cutting for the new room, Buck used his old hair clippers to cut the ribbon. And uh, then the next one was a uh, winery that we just saw. The winery uh, is said to have been the, it's been thought about, it's the oldest bar restaurant in town that has the same name. In 1932, it started out as a place that just sold wine. Uh, other stores in the area were Eichenhauer Electric, the Pom Pom Restaurant that was across the street from the Blue Mill. And a uh, picture I don't have, uh, it was a front porch parlor was down the street on Oakland. Uh, it was an ice cream shop, uh, also known as the Front Porch. And it was at 239 South Oakland, uh, the Front Porch uh, Old Fashioned Ice Cream Parlor, as it was called. They had hot cider, hot chocolate, and espresso coffee. Um, the, the place even had a front porch swing to cool off on hot summer evenings. Uh, also across the street or down the street from that was uh, the old, uh, uh, was a, a lot of you don't remember it, but there was a KFC at the corner of Macon and Oakland. And in the 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, prior to that, it was a, a filling station of some kind. Uh, and uh, just on down from that was Kim Brooks at the corner of Decatur and Oakland. It opened in November of 55. And uh, then this here is uh, a lot of kids from Woodrow Wilson remember a place called, they, they called the Dog House. Yeah, at the time they went there, it was uh, just uh, Oakland Market. But in 1955, uh, uh, see, in 1955, it was opened as a, a soda fountain restaurant called Bill and Lou's Doghouse. Uh, Willard Myers was the owner of the business. They had a jukebox inside and served fried chicken and fries in 1956 for, for 75 cents. It didn't remain too long as it closed and reopened as the Oakland market again. To this day, the teens that went to Woodrow Wilson still refer to it as the doghouse, but they probably don't know why. Uh, the market would get overrun at new time with kids from the junior high school. Uh, I believe the, the store that's actually there at this time might be still open. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, that was uh, a story about the doghouse, and that's uh, about all I had. Okay, thanks so much, Dan. We're going to turn to uh, Chris Barnett next, and Chris is going to talk to us about the Fairview Street area. Oh, yeah, this is the intersection of Fairview and Wood Street. 
the house on your right, the big house there, burned up when I was young. It's been replaced by a house they moved in on the uh, on the left, on the on the south side. You're looking south down Fairview. That is what turned into Breeden's Market, and I lived in this area most of my life, and never once did I ever go in that store. Uh, so I don't know anything about it except that it was just there. But uh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, the Avenue Grill. The Avenue Grill ended up as uh, shoemakers, and then later Summers Sundries, and. I'm getting self-conscious. Um, that was a special hangout for, they had the food in there was just, well, the ice cream, the food, the atmosphere. It was run by Dick Summer and his father, who everybody knew as Pop, and he would brook no shenanigans in there. You didn't misbehave. He'd crack the whip on you in the blink of an eye. So uh, any of us that went to Woodrow, frequented that or, or any anybody that lived in the area. So I, I that's all I have for that. Oh, yes. Okay. Summers was known to most of us as shoes. And the reason is because it was shoemakers before it was summers. I don't remember when it was shoemakers. It was always summers in in Yeah, Roselle's ice cream. You notice it's uh, they gave away a free roll of toilet paper <laughs> with every dollar you spent. <laughs> well, you might need it. Yeah, they went from Roselle's, I guess, went out of business, and and after that it was Seal Test, but it was still good ice cream, and they they had mighty good cones. Their hamburgers were good too. So here are views of the building. And none of these look like the place is in very good condition. Uh, Gary? You remember the parking. There used to be parking along each side of Fairview Avenue. Yeah. Yeah. None of these stores here had parking lots. They, I mean, you got there on foot or you bicycled there or, or drove and parked on the street, but there weren't parking lots. It was different times. There we go. Yeah, it used to look a whole lot better than that back back in the days when it was. Uh, I'm sure it was. Was this when it had caught on fire, Gary? It was. It was uh, after that. It was in the '80s when it caught on fire, and it had uh, the Summers family no longer owned it, and it had turned it changed hands, and some fellow bought it. I want to say his name was Price, and that's when the fire happened. How bad was it? I, I don't recall how bad the fire was, but I can tell you that the uh, that the soda fountain uh, was sold to uh, Jim Gresham, and Jim Gresham took the soda fountain and put it into the Raycrafts there uh, at, at Oakwood. And if, as far as I know, the soda fountain from from uh, summer sundries may still be in Raycrafts. When uh, when Jim opened that place up, he called it. Uh, Ray Crafts Farmus, and it was a place to go in there and, and uh, you know get a cold drink and a sandwich. Here you can see Pop. Remember Pop? Penny candy. You remember buying penny candy in summers? I sure bought a lot of it in Bronson's. Yeah. There's Dick. Pop manned the food part where they had the ice cream and the burgers and whatever, and Dick manned the counter where you bought whatever you see behind him there. Let's talk about uh, the location at uh, 240 South Fairview Street. You remember it originally was a Piggly Wiggly and then it became Breeden's. How long was it a Piggly Wiggly? I don't know the answer to that, but uh, uh, I know what it was that. That's what it was before, and then it switched hands. And there you can see in 1949, it was already Breeden's. And we're talking about, uh, uh, what, the block? Uh, how close was that to Summers? 
it, it was close. It was north of Summers on the same side, side of the street. Uh, you would have Summers and then there was an alley and, and just north of the alley would have been Breeden's. I could kick myself for not ever having been in there, but I have no recollection of it, whatever. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about uh, the Willis Market at 436 South Fairview. That was close to me. I grew up in the 1300 block of West Forest, so that was just uh, less than a half a block away. And Willis was a great place. It was a, a just a, a little family store, but it was well run. It was always neat and orderly. And and Mrs. Willis, as I always remember her being in there, that was the first place I ever bought a Twinkie, a Hostess Twinkie. So we, we would frequent it. There, there was good food to be had, and it was within easy walking distance. Here you can see the, a picture was taken back in the meat department. As small a store as it was, it still had uh, a meat department. It was a quality store, a real nice place. Looks like uh, 59 maybe when uh, Mr. Willis died. Yeah, appears that way. I never knew him, I only dealt with her. Dental school, yep, yep. So at uh, in, at 418 South Fairview, there was a place called Hazel Riggs Shanty Market, and, and eventually it became Hazel Riggs Appliance Store. You can see there they were selling fans for 40 bucks, but uh, Mr. Hazel Riggs operated a grocery store there for some period of time. Yeah, that was a, it was adjoining a house that faced uh, West Decatur Street. And I don't ever remember the shanty being in operation. That was before my days of recollection. So I know about it from my mother. And here's a picture that was taken at the end of the war. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's... Uh, before we jump into Bronson's, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve Huss and maybe John Cobb if he's available, uh, Ranges River Inn was down the road there uh, on Fairview, which was a tavern. I remember that uh, I was in there one time, and I think we went in there and got a soda pop. Uh, other than that, I don't remember being in there. Did you ever go in there, Chris? It was, it was at the intersection of Lincoln Park Drive and Fairview, right by the river, and and... No, I was never in there. It looked intimidating, and I, I, I never could muster the courage to go in. Steve, we'll turn it over to you about Bronson's. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a few things about Bronson's. Bronson's was my favorite candy store, and I like to think of Bronson's as being the local drug dealer for all of us, the drug of choice being sugar. And we were all attracted to it. I think some of the... I always remember walking into Bronson's, and Mr... Bronson did not ever look well. He, uh, his name was Lester, and uh, he would sit, and he sat on the right side as you faced the, the counter, and Mrs. Bronson often stood, and she, he did the figuring with a pencil on small pieces of paper, and uh, she took the money, and uh, they had great products, like uh, packages of sugar you'd tear open, we call it Lickamade, and uh, the candy pills stuck on a piece of paper, uh, very flavorful. They had candy cigarettes. And one of my favorites was the uh, malted milk balls that I think were uh, two for a penny. I do remember vividly how I uh, walked past there and walked in there on the way home from uh, Woodrow with Jim Cobb and Rusty Martin. And uh, Rusty asked Mr. Bronson how much he really paid for the malted milk balls. And Mr. Bronson didn't answer him. Then Rusty repeated the question and Mr. Bronson was incensed and he kicked him out of the door telling that it was none of his business what, how much they paid for the malt and milk balls. Uh, they had uh, things to satisfy some of my vices, like uh, navy beans in a bag for the bean shooters. Uh, they had uh, great uh, Ohio blue tip and red tip uh, matches uh, for our match guns and just to satisfy some of our pyromania that we had as children. And you could get away with it back then. Uh, 
I remember uh, that uh, I think I was in Mrs. Savage's third grade class of Dennis, and uh, I think I just won a spelling bee, and it might have been somebody's birthday, but uh, we, uh, my teacher, Mrs. Savage, asked me, gave me some money and told me to go to Bronson's about 10 o'clock in the morning and buy a package of Oreos for the class. So here's, here I am going up Witch Street to Bronson's to get the Oreos, and I walk in, and Mr. Bronson's sitting there, and he looks at me, and I get my Oreos, and he, he had an ongoing feud with Miss Price, the, uh, the principal of Dennis School, and he, he asked me, I can still hear the quote, he said, uh, has old lady Price been telling you kids not to come here and shop? And uh, I lied to him and I said, I didn't think so, something like that. I just wanted to get out of there. But they had an ongoing feud because she'd go in our classes sometimes and tell us to stay away from Bronson's. Uh, I, I looked up a couple of things about the Bronson's. Uh, May Bronson uh, and Lester Bronson. And uh, she lived to be 91 years old and died in 83. Uh, he did not live very much longer after uh, we were in sixth or seventh grade. And he lived to be age 70 and died in 62. There was an interesting article in the Herald and Review that uh, where she was a spokesman for a, uh, a, a laxative type drug called Natex and nature's uh, X lax is what I think that uh, is meaning. She freely told about her problems with pain and abdominal pain and discomfort and constipation and how the first time she ever took Natex in her life, she was completely relieved and looked at this as a miracle drug. Uh, there was one, uh, one day I was on my way home from school and I remember uh, uh, there was a guy, uh, we were buying yo-yos at that time and there was uh, this locally famous uh, guy, Dan Dan the Yo-Yo Man, out in front of Bronson doing yo-yo tricks. Does anybody remember Dan Dan the Yo-Yo Man? Uh, I have no idea where he came from, but uh, that's kind of all I have on. Uh, oh, yes. The thing about Bronson's was uh, there was a cot back by the meat counter. And, and the whole time I ever remember going in there, Bronson's had a meat market and a big old meat saw, but I never had, saw a piece of meat in the counter. So that that must have been in earlier days. because. Uh, but Mr. Bronson would go back there and uh, lie down on his cot someday and sometimes and take a nap. And I remember Rich, Richard Fritz uh, uh, told me that but he went in there once and he walked back there and he just about died because he thought Mr. Bronson was dead lying on this cot. So uh, that's, that's kind of all I had about that, that wonderful store, Bronson's. That was great. Oh, that's great. Thanks so much, Steve. Steve, sure. do you remember the, uh, the soda pop machine they had that you lifted the top up and the bottles were, were in there and you reached in there and you had to move the bottles around till you got yeah, to a place smart. where you could lift the bottle out? I remember those well, and, and, and a guy named Dick Sanks that went to uh, uh, dentist school a couple years older, he taught me how to uh, uh, cheat the one at my church, Westminster Presbyterian Church, and I, I hope that I never did it, but the way you do it is you just take a church key, a bottle opener with you, and you pop the cap off and stick a straw in the bottle and suck out all the pop. And, and so, so uh, I, I was always impressed. He was an older guy, and uh, you know how the older guys used to sell his uh, three cent a pack firecrackers for 50 cents because we were too young to buy them uh, right. and cherry bombs and they, they made a profit the older kids always took advantage of the little kids oh yeah so, oh yeah fond memories okay thanks so much we're sure. going to talk a little bit about uh, west main street and uh, you know if you if you take uh, uh, west main down you come to a big s curve and the s curve a lot of us know as snake hill well there was a time when uh, the highway that was coming into Decatur came into Decatur through uh, West Main Street and came in through uh, uh, Snake Hill. So uh, as a result of that, uh, there was a reason to open up some businesses there at, at the foot of Snake Hill. And one of the first ones was a cafe that was known as the uh, Acre Cafe. Uh, in addition to the Acre Cafe, it was uh, later known as Taylor's Drive-In. And, uh, and later after that, it was opened as a tavern. I think that was in about uh, 1960 that it became a tavern known as the Joker Club. There was also in the 50s, uh, a, a bakery. You see there the operator of the uh, 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 transfer tap down on Merchant Street. His name guy was a guy named Howard Simon. His father-in-law was Max uh, Blumenfeld. Uh, Howard Simon's son, Steve Simon, 
uh, went to school, went to dentist school with me. That's how I know so much about this tavern. Uh, anyway, uh, there was a bakery. It was in the building next door. It was the Omar Bakery and it operated uh, through the 50s. Uh, I think it became a grocery store. Uh, at, at one point it was Colloyd's a grocery store out there, 2600 West Main Street there. Uh, after it became a grocery store, it became uh, 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 something of a uh, nightclub for kids. No alcohol was served. It was called the Catatonia Club. And uh, I think maybe we've got some uh, articles from the Catatonia Club uh, to show, uh, there you go, five bands scheduled at the Catatonia Club there, uh, including the Crying Shames. And those of you who are about my age, you'll remember John Paul and the Jones Boys and you remember the Crying Shames. I think they were from Chicago maybe, and they came down from time to time. That was a big deal for them uh, uh, to come down. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the Catatonia Club was there. And then after the Catatonia Club, it became the Regal Roller Rink. You'll remember the roller rink used to be down by St. Pat's and uh, then they closed up there and they moved the Regal Roller Rink out west and it was uh, a roller skating out there and they also doubled it for dog obedience. So it was a roller rink and dog obedience uh, in, into the uh, 70s. On the other side of the street was a place known as Kistler's. Kistler's a1 tourist court. So Kistler's had a mobile uh, mobile home court. I think they sold mobile homes and they also had this uh, 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 tourist court, which I think was cabins that they would rent out to people who were driving into town and the people would spend the night. And Mr. Kistler actually had been a, a park ranger and worked in Fairview Park before he got involved in in these commercial operations. Anyway, Mr. Kistler petitioned the park board to expand his operations and he wanted to make his operations even bigger and to get some additional property from the park district, but the park district wouldn't have it and, uh, and it didn't happen. And then the Kistlers, I think, shut their operations down. Uh, I wanna say maybe in the 60s, I wanna say maybe around 1968 was when about the time that they closed down uh, their operations. Uh, there you go, the closing out sale there. You can see nine tourist cabins uh, that they uh, operated there. If you come back, uh, back towards town, you can see there uh, 1840 West Main Street. Uh, West, th there used to be a store, uh, a grocery store there. It's right where Oakcrest uh, uh, tees into uh, West Main Street. And uh, it's across the street from Bruce Nim's home. And uh, that, there used to be a building there. It's gone now, it's a vacant lot, but it was a grocery store. And uh, uh, here you can see a, a picture that was taken there in the grocery store. That picture looks like it was taken during World War II. It remained a grocery store well into the 50s, I think. It was known as a Piggly Wiggly, and then it became known as uh, Hunterford's West Main Market. And they also at one time sold appliances there. In addition, just a few blocks away from there, there was a store that was uh, uh, on William Street and the store on William Street uh, sold antiques, but they also, it was a pet store. So they sold antiques and they also sold pets. I think maybe parakeets was what they were known for. Uh, there you go, Pollard, Pollard Bird Shop at 1840 West William Street. So, uh, if we go a little bit further west, you all will probably remember the Redwood restaurant uh, that existed out there by uh, Scoville Golf Course by the uh, Pro Shop. And uh, here you see the old Redwood restaurant burned down in 1970. Of course, they rebuilt it. Uh, it was quite, quite a big fire. So now, uh, in, in addition to that, we had other areas 
in the general vicinity, not the least of which is Kiwanis Park. Kiwanis Park opened up, I believe it was in 1958. Uh, you can see here the uh, program set for the uh, dedication of the park. Uh, it cost them $7,600 uh, initially for the playground equipment. Uh, a lot of us remember playing baseball out there at Kiwanis Park. Uh, you can see the uh, initial officers included uh, Nancy Sands and Roy Schwartz and Ted Bates. Uh, all of them had kids that went there. And of course, uh, a lot of baseball teams uh, from Kiwanis participated uh, in, in the leagues in uh, Decatur. <laughs> so uh, there was also, you'll remember the Tollies, the Tollies over in the Colonial Mall. Uh, I selected this particular ad. I thought it was interesting because for their grand opening, they're giving away a brand new car, brand new uh, <laughs> Oldsmobile. Grocery stores don't give away a lot of new cars nowadays. So uh, I thought that that was kind of interesting. Another thing that I uh, came across and that, that I had forgotten about was the Pop Doc. Originally, it was F&B Bottling Company. They're at 242 West Packard Street. You could pull your car down the alley and stop it. And they had a big door that they opened up. And uh, you could load your, your car up with uh, cases of soda pop. And as you can see, a, a 24 bottle case for $1.99. And you bring your empties and uh, they give you back a deposit for your empties. And then you could buy different flavors of soda pop. The, uh, it, the bottling company uh, changed hands. And uh, that's when it uh, went from being the F&B bottling company. I think then they became the, the, the pop doc. Uh, you'll remember Peter's Market. Peter's Market, 553 West Wood Street. And uh, uh, right across the street from Mary W. French School. And uh, here you, you'll see that uh, it, it changed hands. I want to say maybe around 1980 that it changed hands there. Uh, Dave Mayberry was the previous owner and he sold it and uh, somebody else took it over. Uh, the building's still there. It's not a grocery store anymore. There you go. You can see after it changed hands from Peter's, then it became a star market. Pete and Jerry Frank, who actually operated now, I remember, the East Side Locker. Uh, they took the store over. Uh, you're seeing here about uh, WT Grants uh, and the Fairview Plaza. Before we get to that, let me tell you, there was this, uh, a couple of stores at the intersection of Grand and Edward. Uh, one, of course, was Lorton's Drug Store. Another was the Buckmaster Store. And the uh, third one was a place known as Waltz IGA it originally was the Scanlon Meat Market, and then it became Waltz IGA. There you can see the Buckmaster family was in the grocery business in Decatur for 62 years, and uh, and and the family operated that store there. Uh, I think maybe as late as the as the 80s. Yeah. So let's let, so now we're going to talk about uh, the Fairview Plaza. The Fairview Plaza opened up. Let's see, we got we've got uh, the article showing uh, the grand opening of the Fairview Plaza. Maybe is that the next one? Cut the ribbon. There you go. Uh, Amazingly, when they opened up the Fairview Plaza, the, a, the shopping center was designed for 38 stores. It was considered quite a, quite a development for Decatur. And the stores included Grants, Goldblatt's, Kresge's, uh, Three Sisters. Uh, I, I have this odd memory from when I was a young kid, and I think that it was at Grants. One of you may correct me. There's a list of some of the stores were out there, but there was a store there that uh, sold uh, uh, chickens, baby chicks, and they were spray painted. Right. And you could and and you could you could buy a baby chicken that had been spray painted, 
And I remember I was in the store, maybe my sister was with us and we were there with dad and we were looking at these chickens. And, and I looked up at dad thinking that I was gonna buy a chicken and all he said was, no, <laughs> I got the message. Plaza TV. Yeah, yeah, Plaza TV was there. Uh, there was a camera shop there. Uh, there. There was a lot of great places. Popcorn shop was in there. Yeah, there's a lot of places in, in the candy store, sure. Of course, we all uh, remember uh, the El Dorado Bowl. And the El Dorado Bowl was, uh, was a big deal. Uh, here, here's a great picture. If you look at this picture, you're going to see three things going on. Number one, you see the El Dorado Bowl and, of course, Pickett's Cafe in that building. But number two, you see that there was a miniature golf course that was there. And number three, you see that there was a used car lot that was there, Joe's, Joe's used cars. All of these things were going on there in that little area there. Uh, on, on Fairview, right there at uh, uh, Fairview and El Dorado. Quite, quite, the, quite the corner it was. Here's a more recent picture of the El Dorado Bowl. And some of you will remember the, uh, the parking deck that they built next to the El Dorado Bowl. You can see here in this particular picture, you can see the filling station that was there at the corner of Fairview. And then next to it, you of course can see the uh, El Dorado Bowl. These uh, looks like a lot of cars on the street that particular day. There is an ad that was in the newspaper from Joe's Used Cars. I think this ad was from 1949. I think that it was pretty close to being a new car. It only had 11,000 miles on it. You could buy it for uh, $1,695. And look at that phone number. It only had five digits to it. So let's uh, let's uh, turn back to Steve Huss now, and maybe Steve can share with us some memories about some of the places on West El Dorado. There was, uh, there was an Eisner store that, uh, and the building is still there, that was on West El Dorado. Uh, and here you can see a picture of it. I'm not sure uh, if this was when it was, the building was being sold. Steve? I'm, I'm back on, I was uh, muted. Yes. And I was just gonna say some things about the El Dorado Bowl. Uh, yes, the El Dorado Bowl. Uh, I saw you had a slide that uh, said something about when they went automatic. And uh, I do remember walking in there and seeing manual pin setters that you, as you go in that northwest back corner door and uh, uh, seeing those uh, like a, a person in there probably with no hearing protection, that incredible high decibel noise uh, manually setting the pins. And of course, I bowled there too. And uh, being an orthopedic surgeon, I do remember one patient of mine when they had that double decker uh, rusted out uh, steel and concrete parking lot that this guy was up there doing donuts in his car. And his car went off through the rail on the second level and crashed down on the ground and broke his uh, lower extremity. Uh, I, was never, uh, I was never happier than when I saw that uh, terrible looking eyesore of a parking lot disappear. Um, I don't really have much of anything on, on West El Dorado. I, I guess I wasn't prepared to say much about that. Uh, I do remember Tollies. Uh, are you gonna talk about Tollies yeah, more than you do. already have? I have not, please go ahead okay. and cover Tollies. Ta Tollies, uh, a couple of fond memories of Tollies. Uh, when I was in Boy Scouts, uh, our uh, Scoutmaster, uh, Dr. Ray Estes would give us a shopping list as patrol leaders. And that's where we were told to go and get our food for our camping trips at Tollies. So we'd go in there and follow his list. Uh, I do remember that they had a large, it seems like it was wooden uh, covered uh, tub with ice water in it outside and they had floating watermelons and they would core them for you. Uh, so you could tell how ripe it was and whether it was sweet enough. And my other uh, favorite memory of Tolly's is the um, uh, uh, time that uh, uh, the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile was there. And, uh, uh, and this is probably not terribly politically correct, uh, but uh, little Oscar was there with his white chef's uniform and he was a midget. 
uh, I guess we say congenitally uh, of short stature nowadays. Uh, but uh, he ha stood outside. Uh, he looked like he was probably about uh, four feet tall, and uh, he had passed out uh, cut up pieces of uh, wiener on a toothpick. And so, and then I got the uh, Oscar Mayer wiener whistle. So I may be one of the few people who has one of the original, probably original Oscar Mayer wiener whistles that has movable wheels. Uh, the ones the later versions had uh, just one one die cast plastic wiener mobile with uh, the wheels wouldn't turn, but mine turned and you can play the song on it. And uh, uh, other other things in that area over there, uh, maybe we could say something about would be the colonial the colonial restaurant. And uh, that was uh, next to Tolly's. And uh, that was a wonderful restaurant. I think later it became Nino's. And I, I don't have anything else to say on that, Gary. Okay. All right, let me, let me just add that uh, one of the interesting things I stumbled across and had forgotten about was that uh, I think it was maybe in the 70s that Decatur was fortunate enough that we had too many Pearl restaurants within a block of each other. Here you go, you can see the article there. One of them was in the 900 block of East El Dorado. I guess that wasn't, a, I guess one is on the one end of El Dorado and the other is on the, uh, on the west end of El Dorado. Anyway, we, one was a beef restaurant and one was a chicken restaurant. And uh, I just have the vaguest of recollections of Minnie Pearl being in town. There was two fairly good sized grocery stores on El Dorado Street. One was the Sears Market, which I have no recollection of other than running across it in the newspaper. And the second one was, of course, the Eisner store. And of course, we had the Cloyd's and we had the Tolly store. So there was a lot of grocery stores uh, just in the uh, West End of, of, of Dennis School, but really on the entire West End. Uh, if we move just a little bit further south, you, some of you will remember there used to be a motel that was uh, down there between the railroad bridge and the area where Cousin Fred's was. And that uh, motel was known as the Chief Illini Motel. And I think it was owned by Weber Borchers. And uh, of course, you'll remember uh, Cousin Fred's came to town and that they were there. Across the street from Cousin Fred's was the uh, uh, Irish pub. Uh, there you go. Murph's Irish Pub was located there, and uh, they liked to solicit uh, softball players because there was a lot of softball uh, fields not too far from there. Here's an article about the Chief Illini Motel at Borchers Corner, where they had a big fire, and uh, I think this, uh, I don't know, that. yeah, there you go. Uh, it states that Weber Borchers was the motel owner said that, uh, uh, and, and then here you go, here's demolition uh, of uh, Elam's, unfortunately, uh, where Elam's was torn down and they built a Rally's hamburger uh, right there. Here's a picture of Elam's. We all remember Elam's, remember the car hops, the people would come to you, bring your food out, you'd order on the speaker and they'd bring you the food. And uh, for, for some of us, we could even go inside and eat inside. So that, that's pretty much our program. Um, I wonder if there's anybody out there that would like to share some memories or some thoughts with us. Anybody out there that uh, uh, would like to share some something with us? Judy? Gary? Uh, 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 yes, yeah, who, go ahead. Uh, Steve Huss, I, uh, yeah. I was gonna say something. Uh, Elam's, I remember had this, they had even, okay, there was Sandy's there at uh, Oakland and El Dorado. And uh, they probably had the 15 cent burgers like uh, McDonald's did, but uh, Elam's had six burgers for a dollar. So that was an even better deal uh, along with the root beer. And uh, I also remember Cloyd's right there on, um, uh, you mentioned Cloyd's, but Cloyd's right on uh, Grand and uh, what would be Van Dyke. And uh, my grandmother lived right around the corner on Wagner. And uh, they had uh, some of the more rare uh, types of popsicles. They had uh, blueberry popsicles, banana popsicles, and root beer popsicles. And you couldn't yes. get those just anywhere. So that's wow. it. Wow. Yeah.
Okay, great. Thank you. I did, I ran across an article. I remember that when you would go to Elam's, you could get a root beer in, in a mug in two different sizes. And I came across a newspaper article where somebody had stolen all of the smaller mugs. I don't know if they ever recovered them or they had to go out and replace them. Interesting thing for somebody to steal. Anybody out there would like to share any thoughts or, or memories with this? Uh, uh, Judy Cooper, I saw you that you were on board. Uh, uh, do you remember the uh, super liquor that was at the uh, Fairview Plaza? I don't know if she can unmute or not. Well, we're waiting for her to do that. This is Harlan. Um, yeah, go I ahead. Remember the, the thing I remember about Elam's was their wonderful breaded tenderloin sandwiches and their root beer floats. I don't think I've had a root beer float since. And yeah, the tenderloin, that was a regular size hamburger bun and that tenderloin went way off that bun. Yeah, it sure did. Yeah. Great memory. Yeah, I don't remember grocery stores because I was a kid, you know, and most of the time didn't shop there, but but restaurants that you know that's I remember that. Okay, anybody else have any thoughts or memories? If not, there's, that'll come. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say there's Bob Fredrickson. He remembers a lot of stuff about Decatur. Is Bob on? Yeah. Can you unmute him or? Yeah. There he I goes. can unmute him, sure. There he is. Oh. Maybe. How's that? Wasn't Tolly's open on Sunday and there weren't many things open on Sunday? Do you remember that? Because I remember, I didn't think there were things were open on Sunday when I was a kid, except that we always stopped at Tolly's on the way home from church. Yeah. But I wonder how that got, how they got that open, you know? Hmm. And I'll go, can't forget Bronson's and their Packard. They had an old, old Packard, which was kind of neat. Oh, yeah. That green Packard, yeah. They were <laughs> uh, and yeah, green they were a pair. Yep, yep. Let me see here. <laughs> yeah, the, the Bronson's would take turns sleeping. He'd be back there while she was working the counters, and uh, uh, then they'd switch, and she'd go back there and sleep. And how much money do you waste of getting a, a striped ball from the ball gum machine to get a nickel's worth of candy? Remember oh, that? Uh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, Steve Huss mentioned Dan Dan the Yo-Yo Man. I remember that. He, I think Bronson bought him, brought him in to promote yo-yos because he'd sit on the fence and do all these tricks. And then Bronson had the yo-yos you could buy. So we'd go and buy the yo-yos, and then none of us could ever figure out how to do the tricks. <laughs> we, had a, right. we had an expensive yo-yo, and Dan was gone, and... We could never do it. Yeah, I remember them <laughs> doing that walking walking the dog trick, and I tried that. I think my dad taught me how to do that finally. I remember the the Blue Mill as being the fancy restaurant in town, and uh, then the Brown Jug came along to sort of offer it some competition, and I can't yeah. remember which one of them had the famous blue cheese salad dressing. <laughs> that, was, that was a brown jug. It was Ben's Barn or something over by the railroad station. And I remember oh, they, had a, Dante's. they had a depression, a depression week once a year or something like that, that you got a steak dinner for like 35 cents, depression prices. I remember going and standing in line there to get that. Uh -huh. what, what did it cost at the- 30, at 35 cents for the steak dinner. Well, yeah, but what was it on other days of the year? I don't know. It was a fairly expensive restaurant, if I recall. I, I don't think I don't think we went there any other time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was Dante's back then. Someone <laughs> mentioned the uh, 
Colonial yeah. Restaurant. I remember the Jeremiah twins worked there as busboys and and uh, they were instructed that, you know, when you took rolls off the table, you just put them into the, another bowl and brought them right back out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and once, once we were there and, and, and took out a roll and it had already been buttered. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> save time. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> it right. them for you. Gary, you, Gary, Gary, yeah. you showed one of those, uh, the picture of the Redwood when it was uh, in flames. And yes. uh, in, in that picture, there's there's two human beings silhouetted in the exact center of that picture watching the Redwood burn. And actually, those are two very close friends of mine to this day, Greg Cargill and uh, Tom T.J. Vaughn. And uh, we used to kid them when we saw that picture. Apparently, TJ had just dropped Greg off at his house uh, on Dennis Street, and he uh, saw the fire engine go by, and he returned quickly to pick Greg up again, and they went out and watched the fire. And we used to kid those guys and say, you know, the perpetrators usually are the ones who are uh, standing watching the place burn down. And, uh, <laughs> they, they, uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of a funny memory. But Wasn't that a place the, that for the owners. Didn't that place have a smorgasbord or some sort of oh, buffet? Oh, wonderful smorgasbord. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, great. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. yeah. Then they I moved love their out, German uh, chocolate cake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do, do I remember there being um, a, a, a teenager's disco at Fairview Plaza? Yeah. The purple oh, the pterodactyl. purple pterodactyl. Yeah, the purple pterodactyl. <laughs> It was actually operated by George Granius and yeah. Um, oh, yeah. uh, Monty, uh, Monty uh, blank on his name, from MacArthur High School. And uh, there were like uh, five or six MacArthur High School kids in my class that ran the purple pterodactyl. It was right there. It was uh, actually, I think, uh, um, George Granius's uh, uh, father or uncle may have had a restaurant there. Uh, and they were uh, allowed to use it for one, like a Friday night or something per week. And uh, it didn't last very long. So. Well, as, as my brother will tell, my brother is Gary, as Gary will tell you, uh, I have never been big on watching uh, any kind of sports at any time. And my mom bribed me one time, if I wanted to go to the purple pterodactyl, I had to actually sit through an entire football game at MacArthur High School where I went. And I did sit through it. I read a book the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what she gets for not coming to watch me. <laughs> Gary, you were talking about the, or somebody was talking about the front porch, but never mentioned the um, player piano. That's why I went. Oh, yes, I remember that. Yeah. And then you were talking about super liquor. I, do you remember the sh um, shape of bottles? Mogan David used to come in kind of, I think they went kind of down yeah. and big and round. round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they had yeah. the mini bottles. My dad would go into that store and buy me one. <laughs> and, and that's why you're an alcoholic today? No, uh, have your that's daughter got the picture on the pa on the temple page? That was um, faked. <laughs> well, it, it only tasted like grape juice anyway. That's right. I don't know. It's still my taste in wines is Mad Dog Twenty Twenty. <laughs> well, Morgan David was the first thing I ever got drunk on, and I was Ooh. sick the next day. That yeah, was. My uh, dad. That was, I was 1969, uh, and I, my mom gave me a glass of it, and I took the bottle and ran back to my bedroom and drank the whole thing, and New Year's, New Year's Eve, oh, I'll never, I'll never forget that, I never drank Moke and David after that. And, and she didn't notice that a whole bottle was missing? Oh, she knew it, she was just laughing at me, Oh. and uh, I remember, uh, I remember the whole evening well. I was my my car wouldn't start work. I was at a DMH working, and I got off work early, and my car wouldn't start, and they had to come pick me up, and they took me back home. 
And uh, to celebrate New Year's Eve, I uh, she gave me that a glass of wine and I grabbed the bottle and away I went. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dan, your, your, Dan, your sister, her Betty, she would have graduated in the class of 68. Is that right? Right. Yeah. But she didn't graduate from MacArthur. She she went to school maybe down in St. Louis. No, she uh, she did graduate from MacArthur. Her she never liked her picture taken, so she wasn't in the yearbook. But her sophomore year, she went to Villa Duchenne down in uh, St. Louis for a year. Yeah. With uh, Ouija uh, Ferry was down there with her at the time. Oh, I I know Betty. I may. I yeah. may actually have a picture of her from when she went went down there. Uh, is, is she still around? No, she passed away about four years ago in uh, 2017. Oh, well, um, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm, I'm the last of the family. Well, if, if I find that picture, I'll send it to Gary and he can pass it on to you. Yeah, I'll I'd like to see that. I'll do it. All right, everybody, we've taken enough time, so uh, we're going to have to sign off. Thank you all for joining us, and uh, we'll have another program soon. Look forward to it. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank Good you. Night, Thank you. Thanks. Fun. Thank you.